Hey, this is Michael Kramer. This is Sarah Nofke. Hey guys, this is Ernie Howard. Hey, this is Scott Moon, and you're listening to 30 Minute... 30 Minute... 30 Minute... 30 Minute Author Interviews with Preston Lay. Woohoo! Hey everybody, welcome to this week's episode of 30 Minute Author Interviews. Let me tell you about our two sponsors. First up is the Galactic Satori Chronicles by Nick Breaker and Paul E. Hicks. The Galactic Satori Chronicles, a thirst for revenge sends one man on a deadly journey through the galaxy in this adrenaline-pumping new series. Asher is a young man whose world is turned upside down when he discovers that his fiancé's death has been directly caused by an imminent alien invasion. Projecting their consciousness into unsuspecting men and women, these aliens are learning exactly how to use humanity's own selfishness and greed as weapons against them. Asher bands together with a group of friends, and these four MIT co-eds are more than meets the eye and go to battle with those who are intent on destroying our planet. Out of the Gray by Patricia Gilliam Aliens, politics, and murder. Only the first one is new. When an Earth-based terrorist group targets Hanaria's ambassador, two teenagers become entrapped in the conflict. Alex Vernon is the son of an Earth Independence Party representative and doesn't want to follow his father's path of political manipulation and corruption. Rika Miller is the adopted daughter of an engineer and nurse who later discovers she's not human, but Hanarian. Alex must decide between his family loyalties and saving the life of an alien he's been taught to fear and hate, while Rika searches for the truth of what happened to her birth parents. The Galactic Satori Chronicles by Nick Breaker and Paul E. Hicks and Out of the Gray by Patricia Gilliam can both be found on Amazon. Or just head on over to legendarium.com, check out the show notes for this episode, and in the show notes we will include a link where you can check out both of these books on Amazon and learn more about them and buy them if you would like to. Welcome, everybody, to this week's episode of 30-Minute Author Interviews. Our guest this week is author Jen Phillips. Uh, thank you for taking time out of your day and coming on 30-Minute Author Interviews. Thanks for having me. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, I'm excited to have you on. Um, we like to start each episode with a segment that we call Two Truths and a Lie, where you tell me two truths and a lie about yourself, and I try to guess which one is the lie. I'm on a good losing streak right now so hopefully i'll turn it around <laughs> um, okay. so do you have two truths and a lie i can try to guess all right here we go so as a child i had a series of pet squirrels uh, that's number one number two for a period of time i lived in a convent and number three as a teenager i competed as a water skier uh, competitively on a statewide level Wow. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> my losing streak is going to continue. <laughs> None of that sounds familiar from what I've read online. So, um, I'm not going to make it that easy. That's right. So, I think it would be cool if you had pet squirrels. So, I'm going to say that one is true. So, I want to narrow it down to the convent or being competed as a water skier. Um, I'm going to say the lie. I'm going to say the lie is you lived in a convent. Uh, good guess, but that is incorrect. Oh, I, man. Um, when I graduated from college, I did a fellowship for a year in Ireland and Thailand. And the subject was um, social activism in women's religious communities. And so that was supposed to be uh, Catholic nuns in Ireland and then Buddhist nuns in Thailand. And actually, so for that time in Ireland, then I lived in not one, but several different convents. Oh, wow. And that then, is it was fascinating. Great, it was a great time, actually. Much more fun than it kind of sounds on the face of it. Have, um, have any of those experiences from that uh, translated into any of your works or has it helped you with any of your writing? Um, yeah, like you'll notice Thailand pops up in Fierce Kingdom briefly. Um, the, um, and 
the first manuscript I ever worked on was actually set in Ireland at a home for teenage girls, which was uh, the main place I worked while I was there. And that was in most ways just sort of a learning experience. I think it's hard to learn how to write a book without giving it a shot. Mm -hmm. And that took me probably five or six years with the confidence that only like your early 20s will bring you to realize that actually every agent and publisher in the entire country was not wrong and that manuscript was not actually any good. (laughs) Um, I think there's still some parts of it I like. I I may go back to that at some point, but, but no, I really haven't done, I haven't done a book that really delves into that experience, but it was a, it was a wonderful year and, and yeah, really, really shaped the years that came after it in some ways. Very nice. Um, So which one was the lie? Oh, I'm sorry. I never, I can't water ski at all. Oh, okay. You know, I was thinking, okay, I know she was from Alabama. I know there's some lakes there, but. No, it's actually, water skiing quite popular here. I had Is a lot it of really? Kids it. I had, had like really bad swimmer's ear as a kid. And so lake water was sort of a no-no, but I like to throw that in because it was a great regret. And uh, again, as a teenager, that everyone else seemed to be have, having so much fun doing it. So your your first novel that you wrote was called The Well and the Mine, and mm-hmm. that, that won the 2009 Barnes & Noble Discovery Award. Um, did winning that award uh, help your writing career? Oh, sure. I mean, ba- basically what that award did was let me – well, two things happened with it. You, you win – there's some prize money attached, but more than that, the first book came out with a small publisher in Portland, Oregon called Hawthorne Books, and I had a great experience with them, but there's a fairly big financial difference in coming out with a smaller publisher or a bigger one. And basically, the Barnes & Noble Award then sort of put the book on the map with the larger publishing community. And it really prompted Penguin to make an offer to buy the rights to the book. And I say all that because what all that did together was let me start writing full time uh, in terms of fiction. Before then, I had been writing magazine articles to pay the bills. Um, And and I didn't. It's not that that wasn't fun, but what I always have loved Uh, is fiction. I'd always wanted to get to novels full time. And just that that award and what came after meant that was the point where I finally got got to write books full time. It sounds like you've been writing a long time then uh, for for most of your life. Have you have you been writing most of your life? And what inspired you to to write? Hmm. I don't know. I mean, you know, I I think probably like a lot of writers, I I mean, there's not a moment I've always written. I think I always loved stories. I always loved listening to them, Uh, whether that was family members, grandparents, great aunts and uncles sitting around the table and telling stories. I loved reading them. I read voraciously from a really early age. I loved watching them on TV and movies, and I loved writing them, whether that was comic books or poems or short stories. I mean, I think as long as I can remember, again, literally going back to kindergarten, first grade, I loved sitting down with a, with a pen and pencil and sketching out one story or the other. I think it took a lot longer before it occurred to me that was something that could be a profession. I wanted to be a veterinarian, like for the first maybe 13, 14 years of my life, and then hit chemistry in high school and realized, oh, actually, I'm quite bad at science. Um, and this <laughs> could potentially be a career problem. You know, and so I think only then in high school did I start to sort of shift gears and think, okay, so I might not be good at the thing that I thought I wanted to do. What am I good at? And I'm lucky enough, I think, to be sort of quite good at something or really moronic at it. <laughs> and so I was really not good at science or math. Um, and but I had always been good at English and humanities. And so you know, by the time I got to college, I'd started to think, you know, maybe something in journalism or PR would work. And again, it was even then long after then before it occurred to me that maybe um, that maybe you could make up stuff for a living that people would actually pay you to write books. I still don't recommend thinking of that as a career path. <laughs> <laughs> um, I still highly recommend a day job, but yeah, I mean, I always wrote for fun and, and, and had I never made a penny at it, uh, you know, it wouldn't have changed that. It would still have been fun and I would still have done it because I 
couldn't get stories out of my head. I think that's probably always a good sign of whether writing is a is something you should you you want to pursue. That um, would you do it even if nobody pays you for it? Um, so the way I discovered you, I uh, discovered your book Fierce Kingdom, um, which is your your latest release. And the way I discovered Fierce Kingdom is I have a friend on um, Facebook who is part of the Book of the Month Club. Mm-hmm. And um, for those that don't know, Book of the Month, it's this website. You pay fourteen ninety nine a year uh, a month, and they uh, each month they present to you five uh, five novels that they've picked for that month, and you can pick one of the novels. And yours was one of them for August and. Uh, this friend of mine got it, and he started uh, reading it, and he put up a post saying that he was 20% of the way into it and was highly enjoying the novel. Um, and so a week later, I was on a trip, uh, made a pit stop at Books A Million, and walked in, and your book was on the main table there, and they had autographed copies of your book. So I was like, I'm picking that one up. Um, mm-hmm. Started it that night and finished it a few days later. Um, I kind of flew through that book pretty quick. Um, that's how That's how I discovered you. Mm-hmm. Um, so can you tell my readers who haven't heard of you or Fierce Kingdom, the non-spoiler book blurb on what Fierce Kingdom is about? Sure. Um, so Fierce Kingdom is marketed as a literary thriller, although when I started writing it, the way I thought of it was as a book about motherhood. I had wanted to write about motherhood since my son was born. He's six now. And one day... We were at the zoo for the like 3000th time and you have a lot of thinking time when you're staring at the otters for the 350th time. And I found myself thinking probably because of the sort of thing that's become all too common in the news now, what would we do if someone with a gun came in right now? Where would we go? There's actually, it's a huge space in here. There are a lot of places, but if he were with me, then what would that mean? I couldn't carry him. I couldn't carry him endlessly. And at first that just seemed like sort of a dark daydream, but the, but I kept coming back to it, which has in the past seemed to me like the sign of a, of a good novel idea if it, uh, if it sticks. And so, and so that was the beginning. Uh, and that, that's the core of the book that Joan and her four year old son Lincoln are in the zoo one afternoon and they hear something that sounds suspicious, that, but that she's sure couldn't possibly be gunshots. And it's not much of a spoiler. This happens by the end of the set, by the end of the first twenty pages to say that they were gunshots, and she realizes there are gunmen on the loose in the zoo. She picks up her child and runs. And for the next three hours, which is the entire course of the book, um, she is navigating this new world of the zoo: um, how to stay safe, how to keep her son safe, how to potentially escape, um, and what decisions to make as she comes into contact with the other people who she finds in the zoo who have also survived so far. And so I you know, came to think of it so as a book that that's partly about motherhood, about, about um, what you owe your children, but also about what you owe complete strangers. Um, what do we owe not only our child, but someone else's child? I guess one uh, one question I had uh, going back to the the book of the month. Um, did you see? Have you seen an increase? Um, I guess in fans and stuff like that since doing um, book of the month. I'm not quite sure how it works really. Besides what they offer people. Uh yeah. I think I I think um, I think a, I heard from a lot of people after book of the month. A few things happened around the same time with this book. It it came out on July 25th. Um, and within a couple of weeks, I mean, there had been a New York Times book review article, and it was also featured in The Skim, which was was maybe so far in terms of sales drive, like the, the biggest deal. But there, there were, including Book of the Month, there were a few things that happened around the same time. So it's sort of hard to track exactly you know, what messages, what emails, what tweets and Facebook posts came from what. But I, I definitely saw an uptick. Um, in response and in sales around the book of the month club time. Oh, okay. Um, and it says on um, your your author bio, your author bio that you uh, are living in Birmingham, Alabama. Um, mm-hmm. Did you use the Birmingham, Alabama zoo as um, the map and layout for the zoo in your novel? I did use it loosely. I made some changes. Um, 
there's also been a, a pretty major renovation of the zoo since I since I mapped out Joan's course in there. So, I mean, somebody would walk through the zoo now and it, it would not completely match, but that was certainly the prototype. It's been really interesting to me how many people from various cities and states and countries have been sure that it's their zoo. <laughs> um, and in some ways that was intentional. I like the idea of, and partly, and I chose the zoo for a few reasons, um, but one of them was it's such a common parental memory that it stands in so nicely for just the really domestic routine side of parenting. Um, it's a common place you're just going day after day. But it is funny to me, it is also pointed out that um, there's a certain similarity in zoo design all over the world, apparently. Not like a super creative um, place for layouts, because apparently like every zoo has pretty much the same parts to it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I always pictured um, the zoo I've been to lately with my nieces and nephew is in um, Columbia, South Carolina. So that's the mm -hmm. one that I had pictured in my head as I was as I was reading it and uh, where they were going in the zoos I pictured that zoo as I was going along the novel mm -hmm. um, how did you go about creating your characters the the main characters um, Joan and her son Lincoln hmm. um, well there's certainly um, there's certainly a lot of my son and, and Lincoln um, one thing that I really liked from the beginning as a, a, with this book was the idea, um, you know, I said it's about motherhood. In some ways, maybe an even more specific way to say that is to try to capture the relationship between this specific mother and specific son. Um, and I really wanted to be sure that the four-year-old was as three-dimensional and real a person as, as any of the adults in the book. I think a lot of times in fiction and movies, kids are just sort of little cute and personal blobs who cry and make demands and are adorable, but they're not, they're not really real. Mm -hmm. And so I had this helpfully model of a four year old in front of me. And so I, you know, in part that was nice to be sure to, to get the sort of levels and ins and outs and intricacies of the way his mind worked and switches that take place during the day and the different moods. Um, and in part, it was a real pleasure to try to capture this is, this is what he's like in this particular period in this six months, because it changes so fast. And so the child that he was, you know, at four was not quite who he was at four and a half and certainly not who he was at five. So, uh, you know, so for a lot of that, a lot of a lot of Lincoln, I turned to my son, um, and I don't know. I mean, there's certainly there's certainly some of me and Joan, um, but not entirely. You know, I always think you you've got to be able to see some of yourself in any character to create them, um, or it doesn't work. She is she is you know probably a lot closer to me than 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 many other characters I've created. I mean, you were mentioning how you made Lincoln feel real i I love the way that you treated Lincoln and I love the way Joan treated Lincoln um in the novel when, when he would ask questions um I loved how she told him what was happening um didn't treat him like he was a not very smart kid or however you want to word it like you, I mean she actually told him you know there there's bad people in the zoo you know you know, we try, we need to try to be quiet, but at the same time, he still has some of those four year old tendencies going on. Um, I loved how you did that in the novel. It, it was very interesting to see the interactions. And even though I'm not a parent myself yet, um, I could see myself in her shoes. Um, and the, the interaction with the kid, it was just, it was very well written. Thank you. Um, when did you have a hard time when you were writing this, not putting, many of your own experiences in the novel? Do you mean in terms of sort of like, as, as she thinks back on life, sort of life before the, before this night in terms of her own experience with Lincoln or background, that sort of thing? Yeah, I guess that. And then also, um, I guess also, I guess the way you built the characters, how you, with, with Lincoln and everything that he was interested in Thor, uh, but in, as a four-year-old, he was interested in Thor and the superheroes and creating his own world. Did you have a hard time not putting too much of your son in the characters or not putting you oh, know, stuff I mean, like I, that? I, I put as much of him as I wanted in there and there. And again, there is, you know, it, it is mostly him. It's not, it's not him across the board. Um, but I don't have any issue with that. I don't, okay. you know, I mean, I think, 
I think that is the beauty of fiction that you, I mean, yeah, there are personal details, uh, you know, for me and family and friends and throughout all of my books and some things that are intensely personal. But the beauty of fiction is no one has to know that, um, that there's also plenty of things that are completely invented. And so, you know, I think a lot of times the power from fiction comes from something real uh, that is slightly masked, something that you've, if not lived, if you've seen someone else live. Um, so yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't feel like it lessens fiction to bring in real life and, and quite the opposite. I think that's often what, what gives it its power. Um, and I don't know, I mean, the, the setup, you know, it's also sort of a question of you can set up the characters and maybe there are some real connections to real life people, but, but the entire course of this book is completely imagined. So maybe Joan has some of my own thoughts about motherhood. Um, maybe some of her experiences belong to my best friend or someone I went to school with or a neighbor. And maybe I've picked and chosen some things, but yeah, I mean, what happens in the course of the book, her responses are to things that I've never lived through and that no one I know has ever lived through. So there, there's always a healthy dose of, uh, yeah, of, of conjecture and imagination. When you, as, as you said earlier, the, this whole novel takes place over a three hour period. Um, was it hard writing a novel that is uh, focused on such a short time frame and not spread out over months or years or anything like that? You know, I, I see, I think, I think there's a, an assumption and maybe, and I probably made it too on the front end that that would be harder, um, to have it, to have it so tight. And instead, I think it wound up being, I don't know, sort of a wonderful framework to force the writing to be as tight as possible, um, to eliminate every unnecessary word and to convey to convey backstory, to convey character, to convey where these characters are coming from in the barest strokes possible. You know, I mean, in some ways it just, it, it focuses everything so nicely as you're writing that unlike a book, right? If I, if I, if, if a book takes place over 20 years, you know, with say 10 characters in it, there's, there's so many choices there of what's said and what's unsaid, what's explained and what's left as a gap. And in this book, it's so forward driven that it was really clear from the beginning that although I, I think it is intensely character driven and the intensity hopefully comes from the fact that you feel like you know these characters and you really care about them. I, you know, I can't make you care about them. I can't connect you with them with these like long rambling chapters about Joan's childhood or what Lincoln was like when he was two or how Joan got married or, you know, all the background has to be done really briefly because they're hiding in the bushes from gunmen. So there's just, you know, I'm only going to pull away from that pretty briefly. So, so I don't know, again, it's not, it's, in, instead of making it harder, I think it, it just kept a really sharp focus for me the whole time on, on what I needed to be doing and how I needed to cut anything that was excess in a way that I found really satisfying and kind of thrilling to to see how how much can you cut how tightly can this thing be done what kind if any kind of research did you have to do while writing this novel i did some i did some research on police procedure i did a reasonable amount of research really basically on all of, all the public shootings in this country since Columbine, both in terms of how procedure might have shifted, in terms of weapons used, profiles of the shooters, um, the general layout of, of what happened. What, what happens in the book is not similar to anything that's actually happened here or, or in any country that I've seen um, for a few different reasons. But um, so there's, there's no actual event that this is, is modeled on, but but I did want to be sure that there was uh, the poli that police behavior, although it's not a focus of the book, would be somewhat reasonable. Um, that weaponry was likely the kind the kinds that the shooters are using, um, and and I did some reading on sort of survivalist message boards and just trying to get a feel for. Uh, I mean, obviously, those who are in the 
those who find survivalist sort of exercises and skill sets interesting or a whole different type than um, mass murderers. But um, one of the gunmen in particular has is very into that. And so for his background, that was part of the research. Okay. Uh, which which character um, did you enjoy writing the most? Was it Joan or was there another one? Oh, no, it's Lincoln, surely. And again, for you know, be, because there is such sense, it's a nice thing from a purely personal standpoint um, to have done this and feel like in some ways it captures in glass this one particular phase of of your child. Um, it's nice. It, it, it was, I observe him anyway, and I think memorize him anyway, but, um, it's a particular pleasure to, um, to see a, a paragraph here or a detail there that sort of takes me back to, oh, maybe the way he used to always bounce from place to place or sing a fight song or you know, little things that might have, have uh, drifted away over the years, but are preserved in the pages. So, so does your son, D- d- does your son go around singing fight songs like Lincoln did in um, the novel? He did. Lots oh, that's awesome. Time. When he was four, he did. <laughs> that is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> what What was your son's uh, go-to fight song to sing? I mean, I live in Alabama, so um, Rammer Jammer Yellowhammer, the Alabama fight song is certainly right up there. But he knew like an incredible array of fight songs. It's not really <laughs> my deal, frankly. My husband is the football fan, uh, but... <laughs> He did Michigan State as well, and um, let's see, what was the one he really loved? Um, no, I mean, I'd say he probably had twelve to fifteen that he rotated. There we go. That's that's so funny. Oh, I love that in the novel when he was doing the fight songs, and of course he did the Georgia fight song in the book. So I was happy with that one because I'm and a Georgia okay, fan. He legitimately liked that one as well. Did he? <laughs> that is awesome. <laughs> um, one character that I. Uh, enjoyed reading and i'm not gonna i hope we can do this without spoiling the book too much um is uh robbie uh in in the novel uh don't want to say who he is in the novel i want the readers to find out um where did your inspiration for robbie come from i mean i I do think i drew him from i mean from a handful of people who i've known in real life and then obviously imagine the rest but it was really important to me for that character that, and again, it's a hard question to answer too without spoiling everything that the reader connect with him on some level, that there'd be something that was familiar and that he remind you or anyone else of maybe some guy you went to school with or a friend of your kids or a second cousin or but that there'd be at least some flash where you could feel like, Oh yeah. Like I kind of know that guy. Um, I think that makes his character much more disturbing and much more haunting if there is some glimpse of familiarity and connection instead of if um, he's just sort of faceless and um, one-dimensionally evil. I remember when he first appeared in the book, um, when you finished his first part, I had to do a double take and reread it. I was like, wait, hang on a second. What? <laughs> uh, <laughs> it was a, it was, a, it was fun. It was a good, uh, good way to introduce them. <laughs> um, there are, for me in the novel, there were, um, there are some situations that arise that make you think about what would you do if you were a parent in the same situation? Um, when do you put your survival above the needs of other people um, and things like that, you kind of, in a way, ask in the novel. Did you initially plan on having those questions in the novel when you wrote? Not in the first draft. Um, in the first draft, there we really saw almost no characters besides Joan and Lincoln, and and I did see it more as a as a very specific study of motherhood. Um, in a way that only a couple people have recognized the the book I really had in mind a lot during the first draft was the road by Cormac McCarthy, which I loved. Um, I loved the relationship between father and son. As I read it, I thought this would be really interesting if it were mother and son. I wonder how, how would that be different? But then 
I mean, one thing that interests me about motherhood is that on one hand it is, or parenthood in general, on one hand it's incredibly selfless. Um, obviously, for you know, suddenly 24 hours a day, what you want does not necessarily matter that much. Um, suddenly what you choose to do with your time is really more dictated by someone else and what's best for them. But on the other hand, it's, it's somewhat selfish because I care deeply about my son's happiness in part because it, it affects my happiness. If he's miserable, I'm miserable. If something happens to him, then my life is devastated, um, that we're all wrapped up in each other. So I, after the first draft and, and partly with some feedback had started to think, well, that's a really interesting dynamic to instead explore the difference in that and taking care of someone you love and taking care of someone you don't know. Um, you know, you, yeah, I think, and I think for a lot of people, if you ask them, say you were in this scenario and there are other people there, would you risk your life for someone else? You, do you put yourself in danger for someone you don't know? That for a lot of people, we'd like to at least think that that answer is yes. But I think if you ask people instead, would you put your child's life in danger for someone you don't know? That that's a much tougher question to say yes to. And so that's what Joan's wrestling with, right, is, is not just would she risk herself, but how do she's making these constant decisions about What's the right thing to do here? What might help this person? What might be good for this person or for the greater good for this group? And what does that mean for Lincoln? And the, and those are they're very tough choices. Yeah, they're choices they are. Where they're, you know, they're, they're no great answers. There's no, there's no choice you don't feel uh, some guilt and regret about. Yeah, they are lose-lose situations. It almost feels like sometimes. Mm -hmm. Um. Well, the novel is Fierce Kingdom, and it's out now. Um, it's a it's a fun read. Uh, you will you'll get through it quick. I'm a slow reader, and I got through it in less than a week. Um, do you have an excerpt from the novel that you could read for the listeners so they can kind of uh, hear what the novel sounds like? Sure, no problem. I'm going to set this up really briefly. That this is um, uh, for, this is about a about halfway through the book as Joan and Lincoln are hiding in one of their, their multiple hiding spots. And she is aware the gunmen are out there. Uh, she doesn't know where. Okay. She can feel his warmth pressed against her from hip to shoulder. He says something else too softly and she leans closer so she can make out his words. What? She whispers. If they killed us, he says, would our bodies go to heaven? It's souls that go to heaven. Oh, yeah, he exhales. And our bodies stay here? Yes, but we don't miss them. The souls are the important part. But we can't see our souls or touch them. Not now, she says. The wind is picked up again. She is cold, but not miserably so. She does not want to ask him if he is cold because it might plant the idea in his head. He shifts against her, but he does not ask any more questions. He does not hum or blather meaningless words. She listens to the leaves and the crickets and thinks of Paul, no way to reach him now, and wonders if the men might circle back around, and it is harder to sit here actually in this silence that pulses and expands. It won't be long, she whispers to Lincoln. I'm still hungry, he says. She wonders for the, south, for the thousandth time where the police could be. She might be able to pacify him for a while, but his blood sugar will keep dropping and he will become a little more like a wild animal with every passing minute and there will be a breaking point. She could leave him here while she makes her way back through the primate zone, past the playground and the elephant habitat around the side of the Savannah snack bar to the vending machines. If all goes well, she could grab a pack of crackers and be back in only two or three minutes. He could wait here, and she would be back in the amount of time it would take her at home to run to the bathroom or to run upstairs and grab a book. This is a pure dream, and she knows it. He will never sit here quietly, of course, calmly waiting, not even for two minutes. And that is, like we said, it's Fierce Kingdom. It's available wherever you get your books at. Um, <laughs> One last question I want to ask you about the novel is where did the title Fierce Kingdom, Fierce Kingdom come from? 
Um, I had a working title, but um, then we started brainstorming after the book sold, and I can't even, re- it was not my idea, but I can't even, I think it was sort of a, a group effort, and I really liked it from the beginning. I like, I mean, there's obviously, there's obviously fierceness in the book. There's Joan's love for Lincoln. There's the sort of fight for survival by all the, by all the survivors and victims in the zoo. Um, there's the fierceness of the animal world that's um, so barely behind cages throughout the course of the book. But I really like the word kingdom because I think there are all different sorts of kingdoms in the book. There's the kingdom of two between Joan and Lincoln. There's the kingdom. Um, there's the kingdom that sort of echoes just the existence of the animals. Um, but most of all, I think there's this kingdom that springs up purely for the three hours that the story takes place, that all these people in one night come together as this community, um, relying on on each other, connecting with each other and ultimately affecting who lives and who dies. And it's, and it's, it is this fierce kingdom, uh, that, that only exists for these three hours. Well, speaking of animals, we are known for a certain question here at, 30 minute author interviews in the legendarium. And that question is a penguin walks through the door right now wearing a sombrero. What does he say? And why is he here? Okay. If there is a penguin who has come all the way to Alabama uh, (laughs) on this particular weekend, I'm going to assume that he is, or she is a college football fan because why else would you come here on the opening weekend of college football season? That's right. Um, and in that case, I'm going to assume he's, that he will say basically what everybody else who shows up at the door on these Saturdays says, which is, um, so your husband invited me over? <laughs> there we go. <laughs> oh, that's such a good answer. Uh, and then before we leave, do you have any advice, whether it be for writing or for life, that you would like to share with listeners? <laughs> Well, I'd, I'd say writing, although I don't know that this is, it's probably not bad advice for life either. Um, what I always say to writers who say, um, what should I do is just write, just make yourself do it. Don't wait for inspiration, which is highly overrated. Writing is like everything else in that to get better at it, you have to practice. Sit down every day, tell yourself how long you're going to write and sit there and write. Um, and eventually over time it will work. It will happen. You will get better, but, um, it's not, um, it's not all about like rainbows and unicorns. It's not all about sitting around and waiting for the brilliant ideas to hit that. I do think you sit down and you do the work and that's what makes things happen. I think that's some good advice. And where can our (laughs) listeners go if they would like to learn more about you and the stories that you've written? Uh, then go to my website, which is www.jenphillips.com. And that is Jen spelled G-I-N and That's then phillips.com. Well, thank you for taking time out of your day and coming on 30-Minute Author Interviews. We appreciate it. Thanks so much. I really enjoyed it, Preston. Thank you. I had fun, too. That is all the time that we have for this episode of 30-Minute Author Interviews. Thank you so much for tuning in, and we hope you tune in on Wednesday, where author Peter Cauldron stops by. We talk about his new novel, Retrograde, and so much more. Don't forget to head on over to legendarium.com and find the show notes for this episode. In the show notes, you're going to find our sponsors, The Galactic Satori Chronicles by Nick Breaker and Paul E. Hicks, and also Out of the Gray by Patricia Gilliam. Let them know that you heard about them right here on 30-Minute Author Interviews. And don't miss another episode of 30-Minute Author Interviews. You can subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Google Play, YouTube, and wherever else you like to listen to podcasts. And don't forget to rate and review the podcast. It really does help us get discovered by new listeners. I would also like to thank a few of our Patreon supporters. I would like to thank Third Scribe, Maggie Stewart-Grant, and Nick Breaker. They're supporting 30-minute author interviews through Patreon. They are also receiving the Patreon-only podcast, 10 Questions With. Visit patreon.com slash legendarium and find out how you can support 30-minute author interviews for as little as a dollar a month. Until next time, stay legendary.